want you to open your Bibles, please, in the book of Genesis and the chapter number 42, Genesis chapter 42, and we follow the reading of God's precious and God's holy word, Genesis chapter 42, commencing to read at verse number 13. I had a little mistake in the announcements this morning as regards Tuesday. It is the 10.30, it's the parents and tots rather than the children's meeting, and that was why there was a a difference there concerning the announcement. It is the parents uh, and uh, toddlers. That is on Tuesday morning at 10.30, so please remember that. We turn to the book of Genesis, chapter number 42. And verse number 13, And they said, Thy servants are twelve brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with his father, and one is not. And Joseph said unto them, That it is it that I speak unto you, saying, Ye are spies, hereby ye shall be proved. By the life of Pharaoh ye shall not go from thence, except your youngest brother come hither. Send one of you, and let them fetch your brother, and ye shall be kept in prison, that your words may be proved, whether there be any truth in you, or else by the life of Pharaoh surely ye are spies. And he put them all together into ward three days. And Joseph said unto them the third day, This do and live, for I fear God. If ye be true men, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison. Go ye, carry corn to the famine of your houses, but bring your youngest brother unto me, so shall your words be verified, and ye shall not die. And they did so. And they said one to another, We are verily guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the anguish of his soul. And when he besought us, and we would not hear, therefore is this distress come upon us. And Reuben answered, saying, Speak I, uh, I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child, and ye would not hear. Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. And he knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by an interpreter. And he turned himself about from them and wept, and returned to them again and communed with them, and took from them Simeon, and bound him before their eyes. Then Joseph commanded to fill their sacks with corn and to restore every man's money into his sack and to give them provision for the way. And thus did he unto them. And they laid their asses with the corn and departed thence. And as one of them opened his sack to give his ass provender in the inn, he espied his money. For behold, it was in the sack's mouth. And he said unto his brethren, My money is restored, and lo, it is even in my sack. And their heart failed them. And they were afraid, saying one to another, What is this that God hath done unto us? And they came unto Jacob, their father, unto the land of Canaan, and told him all that befell unto them, saying, The man who is the Lord of the land spake roughly to us, and took us for spies of a country. And we said unto him, We are true, we are not spies." We be twelve brethren, sons of our father. One is not, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. And the man, the Lord of that country, said unto us, Hereby shall I know that ye are true men. Leave one of your brethren here with me, and take food for the famine of your households, and be gone, and bring your youngest brother unto me. Then shall I know that ye are no spies, but that ye are true men." so will I deliver you your brother, and ye shall traffic in the land. Came to pass as they emptied their sacks that, behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when both they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob their father said unto them, Me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, and Simeon is not and ye will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. And Reuben spake unto his father, saying, Slay my two sons if I bring 
him not to thee. Deliver him into my hand, and I will bring him to thee again. Jacob said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If mischief befall him by the way in the which ye go, then shall ye bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. And we know that God will add his blessing to the reading of his precious word for his name's sake. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy precious word. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus <coughs> that thou wilt take of thy word this morning, that thou wilt write thy word upon each and every one of our hearts. O oh God, we pray that thou wilt bless and <coughs> comfort those, our God, even today, that, Lord, mourn the passing of their loved ones. We pray that thou wilt be their stay and their comfort in this time of sorrow. But, O oh God, as we open the Scriptures, we pray that thou wilt, our God, teach us even through the story that is before us. Help us, our God, to live lives that glorify thee, that in all things that Christ will have the preeminence. We pray in Jesus' precious name and for Jesus' sake. Amen and amen. In the story that we've been thinking about for some time now, we find that Joseph brothers are now standing, or rather bowing before him, just exactly as the dream that God had given him some years before had told him. We find that Joseph is the greatest man in the land, and he looks into the very face of those that have done him wrong. And the question is, what will he do? Those that have hurt him, those that have tried to destroy him, what will he do? Because remember this, at this moment as they bow before him, they are totally in his hands. Will he act in revenge? Will he try to get back on them for what they have done to him? Will, they, will he reveal his identity and laugh at the calamity that has now fallen before them as they, they bow down before him? Will he reveal himself but simply just wipe over the past and uh, reach out in hope of gaining friendship and a relationship with his brothers, which they never really had before? Or will he hide his identity and allow God, the God that he has trusted up to this moment, in the midst of all his trouble, will he trust God who has worked in his own life and providence to work in their lives as well? and see what God is going to do, how God is going to awaken their conscience to the evil that they have done. Well, to find the answer to that, we come to chapter 42 again. And in chapter 42, we find that it was the very latter of those that Joseph decided to take as his pathway. Far better to allow God to work out the situation and friends, let me tell you, sometimes in our lives, what a mess we make of it whenever we try to take things into our own hands and leave God out of it. But we take the things into our own hands and, and react in the way that we want to react. But here we find that Joseph was willing to allow God, the God in whom he had trusted, to allow God to work it out. But, you know, he realized that for God to do that, in many ways, he had to take his hand off it. And that was why it was necessary that he would hide his identity. He would not make himself known because that would be him trying to do it, him taking it into his own hands. And so what we find is this. He allows God to work, but he, ne he realizes something, that for this situation to be resolved, it is of vital importance that his brothers face up to what they have done. If he and his brothers are going to move into that relationship, that family relationship that, that Joseph so long desired for. And so we find that Joseph realized that wisdom's needed to handle this situation in his life. A very important situation 
in his life, just as God had given him the wisdom to know what to do in concerning the dreams that Pharaoh had, to know what to do to prepare for the years of famine, we find that he realized that he needed the wisdom of God to allow God to work it out. And of course, that would demand something from Joseph, that Joseph would have to be patient and allow God to do it. Sometimes, friend, that's one of the problems with us. We're not willing to be patient because it is only God that can work this situation out. You, some people, of course, and they're faced with a situation like this, will say, well, listen, just let's forget. Let's forget the, what happened in the past, and let's try to build a relationship for the future. But, friend, that, Joseph knew that that was not wisdom. Of course, Joseph knew something else. Because some other people say, well, let's remember. And my, I'm going to put them through the mill here. And I'm going to get my own back on them. And I'm going to make them really squirm in front of me. And they take the least offense and carry bitterness in their hearts concerning it. But Joseph knew that that was not right either. And so therefore, he wanted to be a blessing to his brothers. He wanted to be a blessing to his family. He wanted to see the family united once more, or or really be united for the first time, because in reality, the family wasn't united before this. The family had been divided. The brothers of that family, although they had the same father, they, they, they were a divided family, but he really wanted to be a blessing to his brothers. But Joseph knew that to do that, he needed to know what was going on in their hearts. And so, he wasn't simply interested in providing for their physical needs. He could have done that. Friends, he could have supplied them with the corn and sent them home. Say, well, listen, that's them away. I'm I'm glad the awkward situation's over. That's them away. He could have done that. But Joseph wasn't only interested in their physical needs. Joseph was interested in their spiritual need because he wanted a reconciliation. But he knew that a real reconciliation with his brothers would only come if there was a true, genuine repentance. And so we find that he longed to see his family again. He longed to see his father again. He longed to know what was happening to his brother But he had to be patient and leave it in God's hands and allow God to give him wisdom of how he would handle the situation. And so we find that Joseph, in the wisdom that God gave him, decided that he would put his brothers to the test. And to do this, Joseph had to remain a stranger. Now listen, he could not bless these brothers with possessions and allow them to continue in their wickedness, in their bitterness, in their hatred. The last time that he had met these brothers, remember this, they were so bitter against him. They so hated their brother. They sold him for personal gain. They were willing to destroy his godly testimony. They hated the love that the father had for this lad Joseph and the revelations that God had given to Joseph. And they were willing They were willing to destroy the family unity just to get their own ends. And so we find that he determined to know the true condition of their hearts and to know if it was right before God to bless them. He wanted to be a blessing to them, but Joseph had to be patient. As I said, I think before, Joseph wanted them back in his life. But did they want Joseph in theirs? And that was a big question. And so you'll notice that Joseph was not willing to allow emotion to take over because he could have allowed emotions. This personal desire to get this reconciliation without repentance, therefore it wouldn't have been genuine. He could have allowed his emotions to take over and control his actions. If you turn there to chapter 42, you'll notice 
that Joseph was a person who had emotions. Look at verse 24. And Joseph turned himself about from them and wept. You see, Joseph, although he was the second greatest man in the land of Egypt, and he had to be firm, and he had to be resolute, notice how soft a heart he had. He wasn't hard-hearted. He wasn't cold. He was a person who had a heart of love for his brothers. And it says there that he turned himself about from them, and he wept. Look at chapter 43, verse, verse 30. And Joseph made haste from his, for his bowels did yearn upon his brother. And he sought where to weep. And he entered into his chamber, and he wept there, and he washed his face, and he went out and refrained himself and said, Set on bread. It was hard to hold out. This wasn't an easy journey for Joseph. Because he was yearning inside. He was longing to know about his brother. He was longing to hear about his father. He was longing to have a reconciliation with his brothers. But he had to be patient to know that this was of God, that this was not of man. And so we find what Joseph did was this, friend. He had given two tests to his brothers. The first test is in this chapter 42. And the second test was on their second trip to Egypt in chapter 43, verse 16, to chapter 44, verse 34. But I want us to look at the first test. And there are three things that I want us to notice this morning about this story that we have read here in the house of God this morning. First of all, I want you to notice the replay the replay. Because if you look there in chapter 42 in the verse number 7, it says, And Joseph said to his brethren, or saw his brethren, and he knew them, but made himself strange unto them, and spake roughly unto them. And he said unto them, Whence come ye? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. And what happened in that first test was this. What happened was this, that there was a replay of the last meeting that they had together 22 years before. What happened and the test that he put them through was in actual fact a mirror of the wicked actions of his brothers those 22 years. Because I believe that with Joseph under God, God given wisdom, and he wanted to bring them back 22 years and the spring of memory that they would remember that last meeting before he would reveal himself at this meeting. Now, they were not aware of what was happening, but I believe that under God, under God, that God gave Joseph the wisdom how to handle this situation. Now, you and I have many situations in life, friend, but I wonder how much do you seek the face of God and say, God, please give me wisdom that what I do will glorify thee that what I do will be of thee and not of the flesh. Because many a person, friend, has tried to do the thing that is right, but has done it the wrong way. And God's name has been dishonored instead of glorified. And so it is of vital importance that we see here. And what happens in the wisdom that God gave him? It says there in verse number 7, it says that he made himself strange unto them, and he spake roughly to them. Now, the word roughly is hard things. He spake hard things to them. And that's exactly what happened 22 years before that. Because whenever Joseph came to see the well-being of his brothers on the mission that the Father had given him, they spoke hard things to him. 
Instead of them being glad to see their brother, they spoke hard things to him. Here comes the dreamer. They mocked him. Now we find that Joseph, he speaks roughly or hard things to them. The replay of 22 years before. Friend, let me tell you this. You know, sometimes in our lives, we delight in saying hard things to and about people. But we don't like it when people say hard things to or about us. She would like to give, but we don't like to take. And as God's children, that ought not to be. I'm speaking to the child of God here because we read this morning, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. We're not to live in the flesh. We are not to live and do things fleshly. We need to examine our hearts. See the hard things? Is that what we have done? Or do we? But not only did he do that, look at verse 9. And Joseph remembered the dreams which he had dreamed of them. And he said unto them, Ye are spies to see the nakedness of the land ye are come. And they said unto him, Nay, my Lord, but to buy food are thy servants come. We are one man's sons, and we are true men. Thy servants are no spies. Wasn't that what happened 22 years before? Do you remember the mission that Joseph was sent on to his brothers? It was to find out how his brothers were doing and how that the sheep were being looked after. The father sent him on the mission. But oh, they looked upon Joseph. Here comes the lad. He's not interested in our welfare. He's not interested in the sheep's welfare. Do you know what he is? He's only a spy for father. He's only a spy for father. And if he can find out something wrong, he will get straight home to tell my father or our father what we're doing. He's only a spy. Was not... With Joseph, whenever in chapter 37, when he came into the, and saw his brothers doing wrong, he went home and told his father the truth. And he hated him for it. So whenever Joseph came, they said, no, 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 he's not interested in us. He's only a spy. And that's what Joseph said to them. You're you're spies. You're just out to spy out the land here, the nakedness of the land, because there's a famine in the land of Egypt. That's what you've come. You've come to spy out the land to bring an evil report of the land. And that's what they said concerning Joseph the first time when he brought that evil report to Jacob, his father. Now, of course, how did they react to this? You'll notice, am I, whenever he said, you're spies, they said, no, we, verse number 11, we are one man's sons. We are two men. Thy servants are no spies. Look at verse 21. And they said one to another, we are verily guilty concerning our brother in this that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us, we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. They protested their their innocence. But he won't hear us. And friend, that was the replay. Verse 21 says, listen, we, he besought us. He besought us and we would not hear. We didn't want to listen what he had to say. His heart was breaking. He was crying out of his innocence. I'm not a spy, brothers. I have been sent to Father to see your welfare and the welfare of the sheep. And they say, no, 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 no. We're not interested. We wouldn't hear. Wouldn't listen. And now they're finding out 
seems to be that as they protest their innocence, Joseph won't listen. And then go to verse number 16. Joseph says, send one of you and let him fetch your, your brother and ye shall be kept in prison that your words may be proved whether they be any truth in you or else by the life of Pharaoh surely ye are spies. Rather than accept their innocence, Joseph imprisoned them. Isn't that what they did? Wasn't that a mirror of what happened to Joseph, friend? You can imagine, it says there, he besought us. He cried out to us. But we wouldn't hear. But what did they do? They threw him into a pit. They put him in the prison of the pit that day. You see, on arriving at Dothan, Joseph was put into a pit. Arriving in Egypt, his brothers were put into prison. I also, if you go back to chapter 37 just for a moment, you remember the first thought that they had was the thought of death. Because it says in chapter 37, verse 21, and Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and, and said, let us not kill him. Let us not kill him. See, that's what they're going to do. They had planned that he would die. And now what is happening here in, uh, the, or in, that, in that passage, actually, they moderated what they were going to do. They planned to kill him, but then go down to verse number 26, and it says this, And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and, and let not our hand be upon him, for he's our brother in our flesh. And his brethren were content. In other words, they moderated their plans. Instead of killing him, they'd sell him as a slave. They would sell him to Egypt. What happened in chapter 42? Joseph said, let one of you go back and I'll keep the other nine. And I'll keep you in prison. And if your word is not true, you'll die. You'll die. But three days later, Joseph moderated his plan. And instead of sending one home and nine being kept in prison, he moderated and kept one in prison and sent nine home and delivered them, gave them the food that was needed, compassion and sending them back. And then something else. Chapter 42, verse 24, it says this, And he turned himself about from them and wept and returned to them again and communed with them and took from them Simeon and bound him before their eyes. And once again, there's a replay. Now, someone will ask, why Simeon? Well, I believe the answer is simple, why, Simeon? Because you see, of the twelve, or of the, of the ten brothers, Reuben was the eldest. But Reuben was the one that tried to plead for the life of Joseph. And the rest of them wouldn't hear. Simeon was the leader of the rest of them. Because if you look at the life of Simeon in chapter 34, he was the ringleader in cruelty and the shameful slaughter of Shechem. Chapter 34, verse 25. And therefore I believe that Simeon was the ringleader. And therefore Joseph reached out his hand and he took the one that put out his hand the first against him because they threw him in, they bound him, and they put him into a pit. And now we have afresh the replay 
of what happened. One final thing before we move. And then Joseph asks them about their brother. Bring your youngest brother unto me, verse 20. Your young brother. He was the favorite son now of his father. He was the one that the father set his love upon whenever Joseph was taken from him. And so we find that the one who now occupied the place in the father's heart that once Joseph had, and they would remember the father's love for Benjamin because the father's love for Joseph. He loved him instead of, in the place of, Joseph. And when they mentioned Benjamin, the spring of memory. Memory. The replay. Very quickly, notice the response. Because you see, this replay wasn't an act. This, Joseph wasn't carrying out it. There was a purpose in what he was doing. He wanted to know how his brothers now felt about their past sin. It was a powerful appeal to their conscience. A sensitive conscience made clear by Scripture is an amazing gift from God, friend. But a guilty conscience is an awful burden to bear. John Large said this, the most painful wound in the world is the stab of conscience. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, this side of hell, nothing can be worse than the torture of an awakened conscience. I also read, your conscience is as sensitive and as tender as you want it to be. The more a conscience is violated and disregarded, the less sensitive that conscience becomes. You know what Joseph did, friend? He put the brothers into the prison together. He didn't separate them. He put them in together. And as they sat there together in prison, their mind went back, not to the famine, but went back to Joseph. They remembered their past. I read a statement this week about conscience as this. Many a man who felt invincible in the sunshine has prayed in desperation when facing the midnight of suffering. My in the sunshine, you're invincible. And friends, you and I will know this from personal experience. Trouble has a wonderful way of stripping us. Trouble and suffering has a wonderful way of taking away our own self-confidence. And in that prison, for the first time in 22 years, friend, they began to feel remorse. They were scared of what they did. And after 22 years, for the first time, they made a confession. The one to the other. And Joseph, let me tell you this. Remember, Joseph, he acted strange because he spoke through an interpreter. They thought they couldn't hear, that he couldn't hear what they were saying. But the interesting thing was this. Joseph was listening to this conversation. And he saw a change. A change in their language. Do you remember whenever in chapter 37 they saw Joseph? He wasn't called our brother. He says, the dreamer's coming. With the sneers and the, the laughter and the mockery of their brother. But notice in verse 13 of chapter 42. 
Thy servants are twelve. Brethren. Bit of a change of language there. Twelve brethren. The sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father. And one is not. Go down to verse 21. And they said one to another, We are verily guilty concerning our, what? Her brother. Not the dreamer anymore. He's not only even one of the brethren. No, no, he our brother. And in verse number 22, and Reuben answered them and said, Speak I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child. Was not that, not, that's not the language of the old rough, hard, mockers, filled with hatred and bitterness. He's now one of the brethren. He's now a brother. He's now the child. And whenever Joseph heard that, friend, let me tell you this. Joseph didn't say to him, to himself, you know, I'll make them squirm now. I, 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 my, they're, they're, they're starting to soften. I'll make them squirm in this. No, no. Do you know what he did? Under God, friend, here's wisdom. In the midst of this trying situation, he gives a glimmer of hope and encouragement thrown in by Joseph. Look at verse 18. And Joseph said unto them the third day, This do and live, for I fear God. He invokes the name of God, friend. Now remember, Joseph is speaking through an interpreter, and yet he mentions the name I fear God. And the word he uses there, I fear Elohim. The Hebrew name for God. Here's this hard Egyptian ruler. And what does he say? He says, I fear God. I fear God. And he says, this do and live. And he offers them the hope of life. As he sees their heart changing. And friend, let me tell you, time is away, but listen, something happened that day. Something happened. Because from verses 22 to verse 24, I believe it marks a turning point in the newly awakened conscience. Verse 21, And they said one to another, and their hearts melting. Friend, that had to happen. That had to happen. It was painful, but it was necessary. Their sins were connected with their present misery. That's what they were acknowledging. You know, we need to stop blaming others and start confessing, I have sinned. And for the first time, we have an open confession about their wrongdoing. It said, he besought us, and we would not hear him. Therefore is this distress come upon us. They knew that this was judgment for what they had done. My friends, I want you to notice, they didn't blame Jacob for favoritism now. As they did in the past. They didn't say, well, what we did 22 years ago, it was an act of youthful foolishness. They didn't say, it's Joseph's dreams. Remember, Joseph and his dreams, he provoked us. No, no. In the midst of their predicament, friend, it says, he besought us and we 
would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. It's our fault. This is judgment because of our sins. And they openly confessed, we would not hear. You know, there are three words that are some hard words to be said. I'm wrong. I've sinned. I'm guilty. And people find that very hard to say. I'm wrong. It's always somebody else's fault. And whenever they're caught in what they have done, friend, then they blame somebody else. But God brought them to the place where they said, listen, we would not hear, therefore is this distress come upon us. And lastly, the reaction. And I just mentioned this to you. Verse 24. And Joseph himself, or turned himself about from them and wept. You see, it says in verse 23, they knew not that Joseph understood them. In other words, Joseph was listening to this. They thought as they were talking this between themselves, this big ruler doesn't understand a word we're saying. This Egyptian hard man, he doesn't understand. And yet it was their own brother. They didn't understand that Joseph knew every word they said. And when he saw that their hearts were changed, He turned and he wept. We'll come back to the reaction again because let me tell you, it's not only the reaction of Joseph, there's the reaction of the brothers whenever they found the money in the sack. And then there's the reaction of Jacob. Let me tell you, my friend, they are on the verge of the richest blessing they ever had. But they didn't see it. They didn't see it. Look, for example, what Joseph said, or Jacob said in verse 36. Me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, and Simeon is not. And ye will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. And yet, friend, he didn't know that God was working a miracle. That the first time in the history of his family, that God was going to bring them together. God was bringing Joseph and Benjamin and Jacob and his brothers together. And yet he said, because he couldn't understand, all this was against me. You know, you and I, if we go with God, friend, and do what God wants us to do, we are on the verge of a miracle. If you and I honor God in our lives, let me tell you, we are on the verge of days of revival again. Because I believe that God is the God of revival. But we've got to go through with God. Go through with God thy vows to pay, thy life upon the altar lay. The Holy Ghost will do the rest. He'll bring to you God's very best. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we confess this morning that we need, we need a miracle. We need a miracle, our God, in our own hearts and lives to take away the hardness of our hearts and the 
things, O oh God, that grieve Thee in our lives, that, oh, that we might live lives that are holy, live lives, our God, that are glorifying to Thee, live lives that, O oh God, will, O oh God, just let Thee have Thy way in our lives, no matter what it is, and let Thee work afresh in our hearts and lives. I pray, O oh God, that Thou will help that every child of God this morning bow before Thee will, will not resist the, the working and leading of the Spirit of God, but help us, our God, to yield to it, bow in submission to Thy will, and let the Lord have His way. We pray, our God, for those whose hearts are still hard in sin, I pray in Jesus' precious name that Thou wilt melt them. Help them, our God, to confess this morning, I have sinned, and run to Christ for salvation. To realize that this morning only Jesus saves. And so, Lord, separate us with Thy blessing. Keep Thy hand upon us for good, and just take this word and read it in our hearts. For Jesus' sake.